Hi, everybody. <coughs> Thanks for joining another Molecular Devices um, webinar. Um, uh, we're going to be talking about what's uh, new with uh, the Image Express line at Molecular Devices. I'll do a little uh, um, introduction, and then Jane will take over and um, um, give you some uh, input on how we use the system uh, to develop some interesting applications. But first, to uh, emphasize um, what Nathan said about getting help, here's, if you didn't, uh, weren't able to write those phone numbers down, here's the phone number uh, in case you run into issues during the, the WebEx. And then um, we take uh, either technical questions and answers about the WebEx or about the presentation at any time. Um, uh, press uh, on the Q&A button at the top. Um, uh, type in your question. Uh, choose all panels so that Nathan, uh, myself, and Jane can see that question, and then press the send button. Okay, and uh, you can send that. Do that at any time. Uh, I will uh, compile the questions as they come in and um, uh, uh, you know summarize them uh, back to either Jane or myself as appropriate. So uh, just a repeat. So. Uh, I'm the product manager for cellular imaging here at uh, Molecular Devices, and I'll do a little introduction on the, the new Imgeness Micro XLS, which we're excited to uh, uh, be launching. And then uh, Jane's going to be looking at uh, some applications that take advantage of the new features of the IXM XLS. So just a, a quick, uh, short introduction to high-content uh, applications in general. Um, these are essentially automated microscopes, and it allows you to do uh, a variety of ap uh, applications, and we like to say we tackle things from apoptosis to zebrafish, from A to Z. And uh, this is sort of a list and some sample images uh, that we've collected over the years uh, with, uh, with our product. Um, and, you know, it, all the way from um, yeast biology to, to um, zebrafish to neural analysis. And so a wide variety of applications that, that can be handled. Um, <clears throat> and generally the workflow is you're putting uh, your cells into plates. You want to acquire the images. You need some auto automated way to identify objects that turn those, those images uh, into a segmentation mask and then give you uh, multi-parameter data output and then a way to make sense of all the numbers and to plot, plot those numbers uh, over time or... Um, the, the x-axis that's appropriate for, for your biology. Um, and when I talk to people doing ACS, I, I, I hear a number of challenges that are being encountered. And this, this repeats over and over again. Uh, there's a pressure of high on screen labs to acquire and analyze uh, a large number of screens. More and more screens are being moved to, to imaging, either from academics scaling up or from Pharma uh, moving uh, to more biologically relevant assays, um, and because people are moving to HCS, there's a rapid expanding application space that needs to be addressed. Um, so just taking the pictures insufficient. Uh, people want to not wait a long time for that screen to be done, see that screen, and do some Q and A, and they want to sometimes integrate the existing imaging modalities. I'm not going to be speaking very much about the last bullet point. So. This is a, a summary of the method devices imaging solutions. Um, we have the wide field image express micro line, and it comes in a couple of flavors that I'll be speaking about. The, it's a wide field, uh, wide field uh, APS system. The image express also, which is our confocal platform, I mentioned we have ways to import third party images into, into our data management solution, MDC store. That allows um, automated image analysis uh, to happen either with MetaExpress, and we're going to go through some of those options with MetaExpress, as well as uh, the, an option to speed up the analysis with MetaExpress PowerCore. And lastly, because it's all in the database, you can do hit selection and um, some data anal analytics with the QD Express software talking to the same database. So the Image Express Micro XLS system, it's, it's still configured for your needs. Um, it's an automated wide field imager. Um, it has, uh, always has a high speed uh, autofocus that really drives the speed I'll be talking about later in, the, in slides. Um, 
It can be uh, obtained with finger on multi-pass filters for uh, a variety of uh, application needs. Um, we have the widest range of objectives, compatibility going from 1x to 100x, air and oil objectives for obtaining, uh, you know, some great pictures. There's a variety of light source options that come with the system, uh, again, to be compatible with uh, your appropriate assays. Um, we still offer the system as a, uh, as with a CCD uh, version or an SCMOS, which gives us that large dynamic range and large field of view. Um, and then there's also the option for digital confocal, which I will have a couple slides on. FLS is still uh, available with environment control, transmitter light. It's fully compatible with uh, all our options um, and, and fluidics. Here is a uh, sample movie uh, that was taken that I will loop through a couple of times, showing that uh, with uh, the environment control option, uh, given that temperature, humidity, and CO2 are um, uh, you know, kept constant, that cells are happy over uh, the time window of doing assays, and Jane will show you some data uh, analyzing time-lapse uh, assays. <coughs> so the, uh, the standard system, this is sort of a, a 4X objective shown to scale on a 3D 4-well plate. The standard system takes up, uh, and, and other standard uh, ATS systems takes up uh, a sub part of the well. Um, with uh, sort of this magnification. And the XL or XLS system uh, gives you uh, nearly the full, uh, or sometimes bigger than the, uh, the full tree for well. So that allows you to see three times the number of objects in a single field of view. Um, whole well from tree for well tape with a 4X objective, and that, you know, high dynamic range to uh, drive from the sensor. Um, the default on the system is an on demand illumination uh, light source which eliminates mechanical uh, shutter failures and reduces your number of support requirements. Essentially, you don't have to change the light bulb anymore. <clears throat> With the XLS, there's effectively, uh, to address a variety of applications, there's additional light source available that allow you to uh, illuminate in the UV, the near IR, which is an expanding set of uh, dyes that we, uh, we, we see, how to do racial metric imaging, and some fast excitation switching um, uh, light sources. So, as I mentioned before, we do a variety of applications, and um, with all of those applications, you're collecting uh, data di with different colors and different uh, types of plates, all the way from whole animal tissue cells and subcellular uh, assays. And with SLS, <coughs> we've tried to drive that speed down. So, here's a, here's a graph of a 96 volt plate acquisition time and a 3D4 volt plate on the right in red. Um, in the past, our, you know, expected times would have been this full bar uh, with the images micro standard or XLS, uh, Excel. With the XLS, now we drive those times down significantly. Um, and these are, are with, done, with these assets were validated with our own um, in-house uh, applications. Uh, recently, in a demo, the system, uh, three color 96, uh, well, uh, excuse me, uh, we were able to actually acquire uh, a customer sample in um, in three minutes for a uh, 96 volt plate. So a little bit of assay variability, but uh, we think these these numbers are something we can stand behind. Uh, and here's 3D4 well uh, uh, plate data. The one color we can do now in six minutes, two colors in 10, uh, three colors in 15, uh, and we can probably beat that uh, depending on, on your assay. So these are starting to get incredibly fast uh, for for multi-color, multi-well um, uh, screens. Um, that's our system, that's our system is still uh, uh, compatible with our digital confocal system, which, again, helps to drive speed. This is um, uh, this is a, uh, an image with no digital confocal takeout. And on the right, you can see these, uh, uh, you can see these tubules much more uh, refined um, increasing throughput and asset quality. Here's um, uh, a blow-up of those, that image, and here on the left is a no digital focal with the a nuclear stain, um, the tubulin stain, and a punter. On the bottom, after digital confocal is applied, a higher contrast image um, in all three channels, 
uh, and you're able to see these microtubules. And I'll get to a little uh, do a little analysis with that uh, in the next in the next slide coming up. On the software side, um, Pet Express, uh, which is taking those uh, able to take acquire the data and then take those images and convert them into into numerical values, we still have. Uh, you know, the application modules, which are turnkey for easy uh, and fast uh, assays. Uh, we also have, on the right, we continue to have our drills, which are macros, which are uh, powerful, that allow you to do nearly any uh, image processing step. And we uh, launched some time back our custom modules, which uh, drive flexible, uh, but it sort of bridges the gap between application modules and drills. Uh, gives you a flexible tool that once created doesn't need a lot of editing um, and uh, can be reused like application modules. So I wanted to go through um, uh, a custom module editor interface to go show you an example. Um, pulling up these images that are that I showed earlier, which is a, you know a DAPI, a uh, tungsten stain, and a microtubule stain. You're able to set up the module and uh, change the names of your um, your, uh, your images, to be, and this is a zoom in on that that image again, showing a single image. And the goal of this custom module is actually to count the number of puncture objects that are outside the nucleus. Okay, um, so task count granular structures only in the cytoplasm. So we can use our, you know our self scoring uh, to find our objects, and we can use our click to find. Tool which uh, skips the step of having to manually enter enter numbers. Once you uh, select that, you can click on a variety of nuclei to find find your objects. You can do something similar for the cytosol and find uh, your whole whole cell and click on objects and find your whole entire object. That gives that allows you to uh, get to a step where you can see your nuclei and your cytosol. As a mask, and the next step is to uh, find you know granular objects in the granular and in the in the green channel. You can also uh, use um, uh, a click to find there. And this is uh, after you've found those those little dots uh, in the in the cytosol, okay? And um, you are you count those objects that are in the cytosol and not in the nucleus. And you can output a variety of measurements, and you can rename them as appropriate um, uh, for your biology that you're looking to understand. And here, you, it, it might be hard to see over the WebEx, but uh, we, we have the, the whole cell in blue, and these little yellow dots are the uh, puncture that are only in the cytosol, and you won't count the, the objects inside the nuclei. And uh, clicking on... Um, a row or a cell links back to the data on a cell-by-cell -cell basis. So the custom module editor, you know, opens up um, a number of different applications that are that are new and you know allows you to grow with, with the number of applications that your lab needs to do. Uh, here are some other examples, you know, finding mitotic spindles and centrosomes, uh, doing some simple probation with transmitter light with you don't want to use a, a dye, uh, new right output. And in puncture, the previous example, I was looking at puncture in cytosol, but maybe you want to count the number of puncture uh, on on neurites and simple migration assays, either scratch or platypus-based, um, finding uh, the area of of uh, of change where cells are migrating into. So all of that, we're driving the speed faster on the acquisition side. We have flexible analysis. We also need to make sure that an, that analysis is not a bottleneck. And that option is MetExpress Power Core uh, that allows you to take each of those modules and run it across um, multiple cores of a computer uh, and license the power that you acquire to drive the, the analysis time down to be faster than the acquisition or to keep up with the acquisition. And all those custom modules and application modules are compatible with Power Core. So the MTS Micro XLS system, where increasing acquisitions this can feed somewhere between 1.3 and 1.7x. Depends a little bit on assay and number of colors being uh, being uh, used. You could get to choose your own light source, create your own custom analysis modules. Uh, Jane's going to show you some examples of analyzing time lapse data with uh, in a easy to use manner. 
um, making sure our analysis keeps up with acquisition um, and uh, being able to import a variety of image formats into the medical devices workflow. So that's our, our system now is with MetaQuest 5.2, now available. And hopefully this gives your Hikon and imaging a boost. On that note, I would like uh, to hand over the presentation to Jane, who will go through a couple of applications. All right. I hope I'm sharing my application right now. I'm going to talk to you about some of the applications we've done recently on the new Image Express Micro XLS and um, something pretty exciting. We've also got an application note on doing cancer steroid screening and homogeneous antibody detection is a kind of new assay for imaging and multi-parametric lifestyle assay. So first of all, we'll talk about the spheroids. There are different ways that spheroids can be generated from the cells, and I'll show you a couple here. Um, hanging drop is one of them, where you pipette some cells into a chamber, and they will sink to the bottom of the drop, and over a period of time, they will aggregate and form a spheroid. The spheroids then transferred into a microplate, 96 microplate in this um, example, and it's imaged with the imager from the bottom. What we'll talk about mostly today, though, are steroids that were generated on a plate that was using this photolithographic process. And we used um, sellable oncology microplates from a company in Japan, where how this works is the microplate, it's already a 96 or 3D4 well plate, is coated with a photosensitive polymer, and then they put a mask over it, and the plate is exposed to ultraviolet light, which disintegrates some of the polymer. Then what's left are areas that are containing something that your cells can, can bind to, such as collagen or um, some kind of cellular matrix like that. Then once you have the plates, and the plates are what are available from the company, these cell-level oncology microplates, you pipette your cells into it, Give them some time, maybe a day, to migrate to the zones of um, collagen, and they will form steroids within a day or two. Now, uh, each of these wells in a 96-well plate contains uh, 100 surfaces, 100 areas for your steroids to form. And... The idea, of course, is that by using steroids of your specific cell types, the results are more representative of tumor biology than standard 2D cells, 2D plated cells. I'll walk you a little bit through the workflow. So the cells are seated onto the plate. Then uh, about two days later in our experiments, the medium was replaced with a new medium that contained either the vehicle, so the control, or some drugs. Then the cells were treated for 72 hours, and for the endpoint assays, they were then washed and stained as appropriate. And the images were acquired using the Image Express Micro, and we took V-Stacks. These are only 10x images, and took V-Stacks with um, eight images per stack. And then it, the stack of the eight images was collapsed to a best focus image so that it could be quantified easily by the Meta Express software. I wanted to, for people who might not be familiar with this, show you a picture of what it looks like when you collapse a Z-stack. So here is a stack of it. This is not, um, see, this is a stem cell colony, which was taken, we took 50 Z-stacks, and now we're playing it through as a movie as you're walking through the colony. And once you've got that, you take all of those, those images from the stack and collapse them and apply a best focus algorithm to get a picture of all the cells. And this is very easy, easy to analyze image where we show the mask where the cells were identified and the red overlay shows the cells that were identified. All right, a few of the experiments that were done on the cellular oncology plates. So 
Human prostate cancer cells were plated either traditionally on the bottom of the microplate, those are the ones that are shown as 2D, or in the cellular oncology plate, and those are the pictures of the 2D steroids. Then they were treated with um, gemcitabine, and the dyes, after the treatment, dyes were added, Herx just for nuclear identification, and then a cricket reagent from the Vitrogen uh, Life Technologies that stains a marker for cell proliferation called EDU, and this is a red secondary, so Alexa 647, I believe, was the secondary. And what you can see is that in both cases, the treatment of the gemcitabine did affect the, either the number of nuclei or the proliferation marker, the amount of proliferation marker. But what is interesting here is that the 3D steroids are more resistant to compounds than the traditionally plated cells. So uh, the IC50 was shifted. Another thing that can affect the IC50 or the dose uh, response of an anti-cancer drug is the steroid size. So in this case, um, the cells were plated at different concentrations, and the steroids that were formed were different sizes. So on the left, we're showing 10,000 cells, and then on the right, it's 30,000 cells. And if you look at the treatment, in this case, it was paclitaxel, and the cells were stained with Herx again for nuclear stain. In this case, we used calcium AM to show viable cells, and the sodium homodimer to show the dead cells. At 100 nanomolar in the bottom left, you can see that um, there was a huge effect on viability of the steroids when they were uh, 10,000. And on the right-hand side, the steroids were more resistant to the paclitaxel treatment as a larger size. Uh, the cells I showed you previously were um, prostate cancer cells. What I'm showing you here are DLD1 colorectal adenocarcinoma steroids. And again, we used a Jew as a proliferation marker, and you can see in the picture on the left that uh, we had plenty of proliferation and healthy steroids in the control. And then you can see a dose-wise response to the gemcitabine on the, in the pictures on the left-hand side and on the graph. So the Nuclear intensity was decreasing with increasing dose, and so was the proliferation. And you, this just shows you a comparison between two different anti-cancer drugs. Now, another kind of simple assay that you can do with the Image Express Micro is just to see if you have the presence of your steroid, and you can characterize it. So this is a transmitted light image of what the aim was to get one steroid in um, the well, and the transmitted light image was taken. And then Meta Express can analyze this transmitted light image using either a custom module or a standard um, analysis algorithm to detect the steroid in the well and then characterize its size and shape. And then uh, volume and uh, surface area and other uh, parameters can be calculated from that. Next, I'm going to talk about a homogeneous antibody binding assay. I'll switch gears here. And I will describe first how it works for people who are not uh, familiar with it. You would have a cell surface, such as your microplate, 96, 384, or 1536 even. And on that plate would be either cells or beads. And they can be suspension cells or beads that are just centrifuged to the bottom, or they can be adherent cells. To this, you will add an antibody to whatever your marker of interest is, and you will follow that with a secondary antibody to detect whether the primary antibody to your marker has bound to your cells of beads. This is traditionally Psi-5. This assay, um, this is the representative, if you're familiar with it, with the FNAT assay. So the fluorometric microvolume assay technology is what FNAT stands for. And we also, we did um, some experiments where we titrated in the primary antibody and we could 
using beads, we could detect one nanogram per mil of our primary antibody using the Image Express micro. This shows representative images of the beads. In uh, the SNAT assay, you're limited to using the red, red fluorophore. In Image Express micro, you can use any of the secondary antibodies you like. In this case, for the beads, we used uh, Lux 448. And we had a linear response of the antibody from about 1 to 31 nanograms per mil on the bead assay. I'll show you a quick image. Uh, also, here's a curve of the primary antibody titration. With the homogeneous assay, you get this well-known hook effect where at very high levels of the primary antibody, it is basically um, saturating the secondary antibody, and you'll actually get a drop-off in your signal because a lot of the secondary antibody is in your media or your solution instead of down to your cells. But this is also demonstrating the linear range I was talking about in this case, about 1 to 31 nanograms per mil. And there's a picture of it. These wells were run in quadruplicate with um, column 12 was the control, no antibody. And you can kind of pretty clearly see where the near range probably is. So the utility of homogeneous binding assay is that you can screen monoclonal antibodies, especially from uh, hybridoma supernames, which of course are used for things like diagnostics, vaccines, or um, therapeutics. You can detect the ligand binding on a cell surface. You can store up to 1536 well plates. And whether in 1536 or 384, you only need to use a few microliters of your sample. The limit of detection is very low, only a few microliters of your sample, and also very low concentrations of your secondary antibody. Uh, the beauty is you can multiply to different cells in the same well. For example, if you had a parental cell versus a transfected cell that is um, expressing your receptor, you can put them both in the same well. This image just shows... Uh, an example of two different fluorophores on beads in the same well uh, that were bound with the secondary antibody in the FMAT in the FMAT format. Now, uh, an example of a cell-based assay we did. One of the um, benefits of using Image Express Micro is you can take a transmitted light image of your wells to identify the cells in there, in addition to taking the fluorescent image. And this is a picture of transmitted light for identifying your cells. And these cells are looking very round because they were non-adherent cells, and then they were added to the plate after the mixing step. We uh, identify the cells using a custom module for, and uh, identify them in the transmitted light. So this finds all the cells that we saw in our image. Next, we can look at the fluorescent image of the same well. And uh, but this is the specific fluorescent signal of where the antibody was bound to the cell surfaces. We overlay those two, and you see that not every cell bound the antibody. And then we analyze this, and you can see that you have negative and positive cells. The analysis shows all cells that were identified in transmitted light are showing up in yellow, the yellow mask. In addition to that, uh, the, I'm oh, sorry, all cells that were identified in transmitted light are below, actually below. So all ones that are in yellow are positive for transmitted light, but they do not have 5 plus. If they are blue, they were identified with the transmitted line image, but they were also positive for antibody binding, the side 5 channel. And then in addition to that, we've overlapped the image where you can see if it was a cell we identified in transmitted light and the sci five signal was there, it's just the area of overlap in case you want uh, further information. Here is another sci five image of a different well, and it looks like it might be positive because there is a lot of fluorescence in there, but this is actually a negative well. When we overlay the transmitted light image, you can see where the cells are, and they are not in the same place as the uh, fluorescent signal. So we have artifacts that are not associated with the cells. And what happens is we can analyze that, and you see that we have um, identified the cells in yellow, which were the transmitted line images, and then in pink it's showing 
the cells that were positive for the Psi-5 for antibody, but no transmitted light. So in this particular well, there was a lot of fluorescent signal, but it was not associated with cells. So all of these cells were scored as negative. From that cell-based assay, and by eliminating a lot of the artifacts, we got pretty, very clean results. We did um, a little assay development type of experiment where it had three different concentrations. We added um, a large range of primary antibody dilution, which is on the x-axis here, and then showing three different concentrations of the secondary antibody and looking at the assay. And this, just like the bead assay, does demonstrate the hook effect. And here I'm showing you the linear range of those three, the lower end, and at the um, 0.25 microgram per mil secondary antibody, which is the one we like really the best, we had a 0.5 nanogram per mil uh, lower detection limit of the antibody. So every antibody is going to be a little bit different, but this low nanogram detection is very um, is very doable. It's very common in this type of uh, homogeneous assay. The next I will talk about the um, acquisition of time-lapse data. I'm going to talk about the time-lapse assay, so I thought I would describe to you how it's done on Image Express Micro. First, you set up the time intervals and the duration of the experiment. If you set that up, it will tell you um, how many time points you can get. Anyway, you can enter either how many time points you want, and it'll calculate how long it's going to take. Anyway, it will auto-fill whatever um, you don't fill in. It will give you an approximate minimum time interval for your time points. And this is based, of course, on the number of wells you have selected and the number of wavelengths you're planning on doing as well as your exposure time. If you're doing a live cell assay, you need to set the environmental control on your instrument to maintain the temperature, humidity, and CO2 for your cells. And they can be maintained for days in the Image Express Micro. Then you choose your image analysis and apply it to all the images you've acquired in your time lapse. In this case, uh, I show we had 86 time points, and I wanted it to analyze all the time points in all the wells. If, for example, you notice uh, looking at your data that your experiment was really over after 50 time points or 49 time points, you can only analyze um, the time point range that you're interested in. Here is an example of a multi-wavelength and multi-marker toxicity assay we've done. On the left, the cells were treated. It's showing an image of a movie of the cells that were treated with 100 micromolar peroxide. And on the right, you just saw the movie of the cells treated with etoposide. Um, and at the end of the time point, they look very different. So you can tell that the mechanism of peroxide toxicity and etoposide toxicity are different. What the stains are here, and for the next few slides, the nuclei were stained with blue, and the apoptotic cells were stained with a nucleo 488, so it's measuring early apoptosis via caspase. Then in green, that'll be in green, the necrotic cells were stained with propidium iodide for the red, the red channel. And then we also took... Uh, and it's looking gray because we also took the uh, transmitted light images. So the untreated HEMA cells, I'm showing you here three of the different time points just picked out of the time lapse. On the left-hand side is what they looked like at the beginning, very healthy nuclei, a, a couple that were maybe in early apoptosis, as you can see by the green. In the middle, there's a little bit of apoptosis, but generally a pretty healthy-looking population. And on the right, after the 86 um, time points, same, you still have mostly viable cells. Ones that were treated with the peroxide, the micromolar peroxide, for one thing, the cell density was a little bit lower even at the beginning in those wells. But you can see at the beginning they're looking healthy. In the middle, you're seeing a little bit of uh, toxic effect. And after um, 86 time points, almost two days, you have a lot of dead cells in there. A lot have gone through apoptosis or necrosis. How you analyze these images? Well, you come out with a mask at the end with uh, all of your different populations identified. We wanted to identify which cell, how many cells were alive, how many were in early apoptosis, 
radial kyphosis, necrosis. And that's what the final mass looks like in this population. Here is a picture of the image that we were analyzing. Uh, towards the mm, middle or two-thirds of the way through the assay, really. I think this is maybe time point 50. And I'm going to step you through one by one each of the masks so you can see how it works. First of all, and I've shown them here in a light pink, kind of pinkish purple. First of all, we looked at the, we made it find the viable cells based on nuclear size and intensity and presence of the blue, uh, Nuclear stain. Next, uh, what's nice about a custom module, you can run this analysis with our cell health analysis module in MetaExpress, which has um, all of those parameters that you're interested in. But say you're a person who likes to look at your apoptosis by the um, condensation of the nuclei, the, the nuclear stain becomes bright and the nuclei becomes small. So you could add that step in if you do a custom module. And in this case, I did. I, I set some thresholds so that it would detect apoptosis via nuclear condensation. And these are the cells it found on the left-hand side uh, using that parameter. If I wanted to know early apoptosis based on the nucleu binding, and in this case, it will find cells that are in early apoptosis if they are green but not red, so they have not started to take in pervidium iodide. And this shows the cells that are um, in early apoptosis. And on the right-hand side, it shows a correlation. So the cell up at the top there is one that's pink, and it was found to be in early apoptosis by our module. Next, the cells that are in late apoptosis. So they are still displaying the green uh, caspase marker, but they started to show also the necrosis marker or cell death marker. The property might have. And then we've got necrotic cells, and there's not a lot in this image, but I've pointed out um, the necrotic cell on the bottom. It's in dark purple on your right-hand mask. And at the end, we put all of those together, and it identified all of the cells. Now, I will just show you some examples. An early time point shows that mostly we had viable nuclei, and this is shown by the royal blue mask. This is a control well. Uh, at time point 50, the etoposide, which is a known apoptosis inducer, the etoposide treated cells show that a lot of cells were in early apoptosis or late apoptosis, and this is shown by the pink mask for early and the white mask is on the cells that were late apoptosis. At the end of the experiment, this is showing a peroxide treated cell. Uh, well, we had most of the cells were already in late apoptosis and that is shown by the white mask. And there were a few that were also um, necrotic and those that were in purple and it's kind of hard to see, I know, on the WebEx. So, I circled one here that's purple. There's several in that picture. You can take the data from this analysis into our software called Acuity Express. Well, first of all, you can take that analysis, and if you have a lot of wells to analyze, you can do it in the Image Express, um, in the Meta Express Power Core, where you can multi-thread the data analysis and get your results really quickly, whether you have a custom module or a standard module. Um, next, I'm going to show you um, the Acuity Express analysis of the time-lapse data. And I'll have to point out the different uh, treatments here. On the top left, we've got early, early apoptosis um, across time. So your x-axis is time. Your y-axis is the percent of cells that are in apoptosis. And the control is this bottom line, so there is not very much apoptosis going on. Your etoposide is kind of peaked, apoptosis peaked in the middle. And then your H2O2, it was occurring more at the end. This is a nice way to see the mechanism of cell death over time. Then here it also shows your viable cells, your control here. Uh, it actually dies off towards the end, but um, it could be because of the nuclear stain is either fading or because it is um, toxic itself. 
that you can use the control to compare to the peroxide-treated wells and the atopicide-treated wells. And in this case, necrosis, where um, H2O2's mechanism is generally uh, via necrosis, and you can see that it does have a lot more necrosis than the atopicide. And in this particular graph, I did leave out the control because it was down here with the atopicide, and it was hard to tell them apart. Then late apoptosis is also one of the parameters we chose to show in acuity express. So you can use time-lapse imaging for uh, a lot of different things. We showed toxicity testing. You can use it to monitor proliferation or lack of. You can use it to measure the mechanism of cell death over time. And another thing time-lapse imaging is great is for just characterizing the kin kinetics of your reaction. If you're in development, you could use it to determine the correct time to read your endpoint assay. And which makes it much easier for screening, uh, obviously doing an endpoint assay versus a uh, time lapse, you know, 24, 40-hour time lapse experiment. And you can use time lapse for observing differentiation of cells. Neurite outgrowth, for example, you can plant your neurons and watch how they grow in response to growth factors or growth inhibitors. You can um, look for the appearance of markers, of differentiation markers, or any other markers if, if you don't even have stem cells, and we've used it a lot um, for quantitating uh, cardiomyocyte contractions. Put your cardio plated cardiomyocytes in a well and label them with a calcium flux dye, and you can watch them uh, contract, basically pump the calcium in and out of the cells. I would like to acknowledge some people in-house. Steve Luke, Jared Posh for the um, FMAT type of data, and Mahomi Suzuki from our Japan office, our application scientist. And then the work that Mahomi did with uh, the cellular oncology plates, the company Toyo Gosi in Japan, and the scientists from there, Koichi Yokota and Tomoki Jamura. I also wanted to point out if you're really interested in the spheroid assay, particularly on the cellular oncology plates, the company um, Toyo Gosi does have application notes and posters on their website as well, and we've got an application note available. I'm going to open it up for questions, and I think I will, um, I think Krishna will get on the line and probably moderate the questions. And this is um, the slide. I will pass it back to Grisha. Yep. So, um, uh, I, uh, to Nathan, you don't need to uh, hand me the ball. This, we already have the um, uh, the question um, help uh, menu up. So, just to uh, go through this again, if you want, uh, I've seen some questions from people, and I'll, I'll ask that of Jane as appropriate. But for those who haven't been, if you have a question, uh, press on the Q and A uh, button on the toolbar. Uh, look at the Q&A window, type in a question, choose all panelists. Uh, a couple of the questions have been going to uh, Nathan and not to all panelists, so I haven't been seeing them. Uh, send, send me to choose all panelists so we can all see them, and then press the send button. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, Jane, or uh, I'll ask the questions to Jane, and if she has uh, trouble with any of them, uh, she might pass them back to me. So Jane does a question about, can the system be used to image trans well, uh, trans well assays? There was not much detail about the assay in question, just whether you can image trans wells. Mm. You know, uh, I don't have a uh, personal experience with that. I don't, I guess maybe you do know. I, I can't answer yeah. that question. I think so, it's so really difficult. Uh, uh, it's actually not difficult. Uh, it's one of the QHA systems that can do it. Um, uh, people do um, uh, people do transport assays with our system all the time. Uh, we in-house personally probably don't have experience with that. Our field application team does uh, work with customers to uh, to make that um, uh, uh, happen. <clears throat> Another question is. Uh, can you take a variety of uh, resolution images uh, with the system? Um, resolution. I don't know if you're talking about uh, different magnifications. Yes. 
I, I might I may be going off on a tangent if I'm do you think it's magnification, Bruce? Yes, magnification. Okay. So I may be going off on a little bit of a tangent. I don't talk about it here, but we have presented before where you can do something called targeted imaging where say you have a big ninety six watt plate and you think you only have one small colony or spheroid in there, you can take a low magnification image of it and find the, if there is a spheroid or colony present, you can find it with low magnification and then have the instrument automatically switch to high mag and go right to that spot. Okay. Um, uh, there was um, a, uh, for that, yeah, so, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, the system comes configurable with 1x to 100x, so you can screen at any of those uh, magnifications to get different resolution imaging. Um, there was a follow-up. I'll take it on trans wells. Uh, yeah, so the um, it's got to do with epithelial cells and same zero one. Yep, um, I believe um, at certain magnifications you can do that type of assay um, uh, with our system. Uh, you focus on the bottom of the well, and then you focus up. You step up to where the trans well will be located. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just reading the the questions. Um, so, uh, there's a question about, uh, different, uh, coatings on plates. Um, we have, and I'll take that question, we have customers who have imaged, uh, cells in a variety of, uh, coated plates. Uh, clearly we haven't experimented with every coating and thickness of coating, but even uh, uh, samples in pretty thick um, uh, uh, gel-like material can be imaged. Um, right, especially if it's difficult, you could take these stacks. Yep. If, if you have your samples, uh, at, your cells are going to be found at different uh, points in the Z plane of uh, off the bottom of the page. You can, as James showed with the spheroid, you can take a number of these stacks and get data throughout that uh, thick sample. Um, there's a question about t um, temperature, which I will try and take because it's not quite clear. Um, the, the whole plate is um, under, you know, uh, 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 a, the constant temperature. So uh, one reason why those those movies play so well, um, and you know you. You're going to different wells over time is that um, the the whole uh, the whole area is temperature controlled the objective the plate the stage um, everything is sort of at at the temperature that is determined by the system um, Jane there's a question about the uh, spheroids why do the cells you know uh, go to where they do and form spheres? Um, well, the experts are going to be the company that makes the plate, but it's because they, there are specific areas of the plate that has, have a, um, the matrix, like collagen or something that the, that the cells want to attach to, and the other areas have been wiped so that they're, they're repelling the cells, basically, to put it simply. So they're kind of repelling the cells, and so the cells migrate into their zone where they, where they want to grow. Okay. Um, okay, I'm trying to just going through and uh please send questions. Uh, I'm just looking through the the list and you might hear me clicking, uh looking at the questions. And uh, also about the about the spheroids, that um that company, Toyo Gosi, has um uh, examples of a lot of different cell lights, a couple dozen probably cell types if that you're want to see if they've done any experiments with your cell type that you're interested in. Um, I think uh, that is towards the end of uh, the questions. Um, if I missed, I'll, get, I'll wait on a few more minutes. If I've missed anybody's question, um, please um, go ahead and resend it. If, there are, if you have an existing system and have some technical questions, 
Uh, you can drop me an email and I'll get it to the correct uh, people. Uh, Um, uh, let's go to the slide and see one more question come in. So, yeah, send me an email if you have some, if I didn't, wasn't able to get your question appropriately. Um, my email is at the top, krishakchandy at molda.com. If you have an application question, jane.hesley at molda.com. If you want to learn more uh, about the products um, that we just discussed, you can go to www.molacadevices.com slash HCF. Um, we post the webinars within two weeks, usually much quicker than that, at www.molecularevices.com slash HCF webinars. Actually, all our past webinars are up there, and we have some uh, other interesting webinars on uh, that uh, some of our customers have presented, as well as we. Uh, uh, there's some on antibody discovery, on time lapse analysis. Um, so there's a history of our web past webinars. Um, if you are an existing customer and have uh, uh, technical questions that you want to uh, ask other uh, customers or our uh, support team on, uh, there's a forum that's uh, completely open, metamorph.marketdevice.com slash forum, and that's a place you can share uh, journals or custom modules with other users and see other examples, and you can also post questions about um, building your own. Now, this question um, about the steroids. Are all the cells in the steroid in focus? Yes, because you are taking, uh, what James showed was you can take a, uh, sh uh, either a very, uh, fine grained Z stack or a, or a rough grained Z stack through the steroids and collapse it and collect all the data for all the cells. So yeah, all the cells in the steroid will be in focus for an analysis. At least that's the ones, the ones we showed. Um, if you have more on that, uh, again, please send us an email. On that note, um, I will give it actually one more minute to make sure that there aren't any other questions, and then we will uh, hang up. And thanks very much, and please uh, pay attention and um, to uh, uh, other um, uh, webinars that will come from us, and I hope to uh, have you attend the next one. That note, I don't see any other questions. Nathan, can you, uh, I think we can end the session. Thank and you. Appreciate Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for attending today. That it does conclude today's presentation. You may now disconnect. <laughs>